The growing calls across the nation to defund the police. To end policing as we know it. Off the charts violence in New York City. 11 people shot in just eight hours on this is Sunday. About the police officers, officers who every single day put on that uniform and they run towards danger when we run away from it. Guns up, giddy up. What's up, everybody? It's me. It's me, Eric Tanzi. Today, I am playing assistant to the assistant pastor. Some of you might know, some of you might not. Mike is down. He's down with the Rona, uh, but he's okay. He's recovering. We gave him the night off tonight. And so here I am playing the assistant pastor. And I know, I get it. I get it. The assistant pastor, pastor is not always the best, but there's still a message to be told. So we're going to switch it up tonight. We're going to we're gonna throw a curveball. We're going to throw a curveball tonight. Uh, we're going to do something that I used to like to do when the job threw me a curveball. When it's raining, when it's snowing, you're stuck behind the church. Nothing's going on. Snow calls going out. I used to sit on my computer and give myself extreme anxiety. Uh, I don't know why I did that, but I would like to watch YouTube videos of lions eating people, uh, people dying while scuba diving, people falling out of planes without parachutes, all the things that really get my blood pressure up, gets everything pumping, brings the anxiety. And this story that I'm going to tell you tonight was one of my favorite stories to really freak me out. I used to, uh, I used to make my rookies sit through this story. I would play all the YouTube videos. So I'm really excited tonight to be able to tell you this story. We're going to have a lot of time for call-ins. I know that people might have had similar situations. People might have had crazy uh, situations like this that they were involved in or that they might just have questions. So listen, some of you know the ending of this story. Some of you have heard this story, and that's fine. Don't ruin it for the other listeners uh, in the chat. I see you guys in the chat already, uh, Steezy Dan. I know you've heard the story, it looks like. Uh, but let's not ruin it. Uh, let's not ruin the story. I'm going to tell it in its entirety because I feel like I've told this story to enough rookies, to enough people, but I think I can do a pretty good job, and I think I can probably tell it better than anyone else. So, unfortunately, Mike might show up, though. Hang on. Fortunately, Mike might show up in the chat. I'm not sure yet, but unfortunately, he's not here with me, as some of those of you are tuning in to the Tuesday night special uh, but he's down for the count. He's just a little bit under the weather. We're going to give him a night off. He'll be back on Tuesday. I assure you, I promise you he'll be back. Uh, everything is fine, but tonight it's just going to be me and I'm going to do what I used to do in my cop car. And I'm going to take you on a little journey. I'm going to tell a little story. And we're going to do some call-ins. We're going to have fun. Uh, but a little disclaimer, if you've got anxiety issues, try not to be such a pussy, uh, and toughen up because this show, uh, is, is going to definitely probably invoke a little bit of that tonight. So this story, because the reason why I chose this story to tell is because it's Thanksgiving ish, right? And we have Thanksgiving coming up in two weeks. If we told this story next week, I think it's too close to Thanksgiving. It's too close. So going into that time of the year, I want to plant this seed in your brain. I want you to think about this for all of Thanksgiving and for every Thanksgiving to come. All right. So the story takes place on November the 24th, 2009. The story is about a man named John Edward Jones. John was a 26-year-old dude who was from Utah originally, but living in Virginia. He was a medical student, a family man. He was married to a beautiful young girl. Her name was Emily, uh, Emily Jones. She was prego, just like me. I've got a, I've got a wife. I've got three kids, one on the way. Uh, but this is a good family man. He was religious. He's from Utah, so you can kind of guess what religion he was. Mormon, for those of you who didn't know. Uh, and just like most good human beings and good family people, he was home back in Utah for the holidays. Just like some of us are going to be back at home for the holidays. I know I'm going to Charlotte for the holidays. I'll be with my family. There's 22 of us sitting at one table. I love it. It's my favorite time of year. I really enjoy it. So, uh, Emily and John, they fly back to Utah to be with their family and friends for the Thanksgiving holiday, 2009. 
Here's a couple of tips about Utah for those of you who have never been. Uh, it's named after the Amer the Native American tribe, the Utes, which means mountain people, which makes me think of the movie Hills Have Eyes. Uh, I've always been terrified of that movie. And when I think of mountain people, I think of the Hills Have Eyes. Uh, it's probably another reason why I don't like Utah all that much. I don't know if, if you've ever been to Utah, it's, it's ish. It's all right. It's pretty. It's just not, there's not a lot to do. I guess if you're into the snow and the things there is, but I'm not into those things. So Utah doesn't really have that much for me. Uh, but Salt Lake city, here's a great fun fact about Utah. Salt Lake city uh, has more plastic surgeons per capita than anywhere else in the United States. So that's pretty cool. Uh, but anyway, enough about Utah. Here we go. Let's get into the story. Uh, day before Thanksgiving, since there's not anything else to do, unless you want to go get a, uh, unless you want to go get plastic surgery, there's no snow on the mountains. It's Thanksgiving. It's not there yet. So these guys weren't into plastic surgeries. They were into spelunking. Spelunking is just cave diving, going into tight spaces and goofing around. So uh, John, his family, uh, day before Thanksgiving, they decide, hey, you know what? Let's go check out this cave that we've never checked out before. Let's go spelunk it. I think it's important to notice at this point in the story that uh, they weren't amateur cave divers. They weren't professionals, but they weren't amateur. So they've been doing this a lot uh, when they were younger. It was kind of spelunking as like a family hobby to these people. And by the way, 11 of them are about to go spelunking in a cave in Utah. 11 family members, couple friends thrown in there as well. Um, but this is what they kind of do. Just kind of Mike uh, does jujitsu. I like to play rugby. I like to go skateboarding. These guys like to go cave diving or cave exploring, I guess you should say. Um, so uh, as a matter of fact, that they're so into this that John and his brother, Josh, who we're going to hear all about tonight, they actually uh, volunteered as um, victims, practice victims for a search and rescue team that actually John's father founded. It was an organization called the Utah Cave Rescue Organization. And so they were all, like I said, like really into this whole cave diving thing. I, everybody's got something, right? Skydiving, scuba diving for them. I know it's weird, but spelunking was their cup of tea, I guess. So um, the cave they decided to go explore, title of today's show, The Nutty Putty Cave. All right, so they head over to the Nutty Putty Cave. The Nutty Putty Cave was discovered uh, by Dale Green in 1960, but it was actually found by ranchers. There was a couple of ranchers, they saw a hole, and this hole always was like surrounded by snakes. It's almost as if snakes were guarding this thing saying, hey, stay the fuck out. It's not a cool place to be. Uh, that, that's enough for me. If I see snakes, I'm done. I'm out. I don't need to be there. It's obviously God telling me, don't go in this hole. There's snakes. But farmers, they kill the snakes, whatever. Uh, they tell, they think it's a cave. They go to this explorer named Dale Green. He goes down there and he's the first person to actually go and explore the cave. Now, they call it the Nutty Putty Cave. He names it the Nutty Putty Cave because of the clay that lines the walls, kind of makes it muddy, makes it uh, a little bit nutty. It's hard to Slot. It's hard to get your footing right, getting grips in this cave. It's a it's a hydrothermal cave. If anybody gives a shit what that means, uh, I don't know what it means, and I'm not a geologist, so I'm not going to pretend like I know what hydrothermal cave is. All I know is that this cave is a humid 60 degrees. 60 degrees in itself is a, is a great temperature, but you add that humidity, it can get a little bit stagnant, a little bit uncomfortable, especially if you're not into tight spaces, right? And the stagnant, you know, kind of like moist feelings already kind of icky. Anyway, so that's what this cave's got going on for it. Uh, it's super long cave. It's about 1,500 feet. Um, it's very narrow. There's a lot of long, tight spaces to have to navigate in this cave. Uh, lots of people explore it. Uh, about 5,000 to 10,000 people a year goof around in the 1,500-foot long cave. But in this cave, there are narrow passages. One of the main attractions of the cave is actually called the birth canal, but we'll get into that later. Um, the entrance of the cave, it's, it's nothing special. It's actually called the blowhole. It's just like a hole in the ground in the middle of the, of Utah. There's kind of like some mountains off in the background, a long plateau where it's just like a big field of grass, like what you would see in an old Western movie. And then like a series of like a rock hill, almost not so much a, uh, a mountain, but more like a hill. And there's a hole in the hill. And that hole is about six feet in a circular is it radius or diameter? Can you say diameter? Circumference? Six feet. So it's a six foot wide circle. 
Um, which isn't that bad, right? Like that's not that tight. Six feet, like I'm about six foot. So if I lied, if I laid down horizontally, not that, not that tight of a space, but it drops down about 15 feet. And then once you drop down 15 feet and you can kind of like, there's enough of rock formation to kind of crawl your way down into this thing. You don't have to like repel down. You can kind of like arch your back and use your legs on the walls, kind of walk it down. Um, and then once you get down inside, um, it opens up into a passageway that's about 19 feet long and it's about three feet wide. So now it's getting a little bit narrow. It's getting a little bit tighter. I'm telling you right now, like I'm probably out. I've done these before, right? So in the special force qualification course at SEER school, they put you like in a ditch culvert. It's, I, dude, I don't know, but maybe it's 1500 feet long. It's, it felt like we were in there forever. There's a little bit of water in there. You couldn't even see your hand in front of your face. You got to crawl. Don't make any hard left or right hand turns while you're in there. Good luck. Uh, when, you know, when you get to the other side, problem is, is that there's people that go in behind you. And so the water, if they start moving too much, it starts to slosh the water up It splashes in your face. It makes it hard to breathe. Um, so I've been there. I've been on the verge of panic and I don't necessarily like it. So I think once that hole got to about three feet wide, I, you know, I might be out at this point, but anyway, these dudes, there's cave divers, they do. So they go in the hole and they start splunking around from there. So people do it all the time. All right. Uh, there's a lot of large rooms. There's small rooms. There's dead ends. There's even a part of this cave that's called the maze. It's kind of like where there's a bunch of like false, uh, false exits, false, um, a pass that some go to dead ends. Some go to the same room as that you started off in. Some take you to rooms that you think you started off in, but you didn't. And then there's other like false entrances that go to dead ends. So it's kind of like a maze. You kind of work your way through it, but it's, it's, it's not too crazy because they, they let boy scouts do this all the time. Like they just send out for like the day. It's like a bungalow bounce for the boy scouts. They're just like, Hey, go fuck around in this cave. Uh, have fun kids be back out uh, by lunch. Set your, set your watch set your watches. Uh, but yeah, again, the, uh, so one, Oh, another big obstacle inside. we got a picture of this as well. Oh, if you're not, if you're following around on YouTube, we're going to put pictures up. So if you are listening to this and you want to see pictures of the nutty putty cave, you're going to want to follow this on YouTube, smash that like button while you're there. Um, the big obstacle there is called the, uh, it's a 25 foot long slide. It's at a 42 degree angle and they called it the big slide. And uh, it's in there. A lot of people like to go and, and check it out. It's not really that far into the cave. It's only about 40 feet into this cave. So a lot of people just go to that. There's like some ropes in there and you can kind of climb up. There's some false rooms. I mean, some false pathways that just dead end and they go into these little rooms. People can check it out. But again, you're not going like super deep and getting super technical with the cave at this point. So <clears throat> past that, if you want to get crazier, again, the star challenge here, kind of what like really gets uh, the enthusiast to come to the Nutty Putty Cave is something called the birth canal. Now, I've already been through a birth canal. I've done it once. I don't, I don't think I need to do it again. I feel like I'm a winner. I think anybody that's gone through the original nature's birth canal, my the, the cave that I was in was called Patsy's Shame Cave. That's what I named it, Patsy Tansy Shame Cave. But I've already passed through the birth canal in the Patsy Tansy Shame Cave. Came out okay. Don't need to do another one. Um, and so... I'm going to show on the YouTubes, they'll be playing a video of this, but I'm going to explain the birth canal. So not that long. If you think about it, it's 25 feet. But if you're watching on the YouTubes, the 25 feet is very, very difficult to get down. So it's a long passageway. It's about three feet tall by two feet wide. And you have to pretty much basically bring both of your arms into your ribs cage and then you have to barely use your fingers and kind of worm your way through this birth canal. A lot of people make the joke that it actually like deforms your head and your face because your face is kind of like glued to the floor as you're trying to inch your way, uh, inch your way through the birth canal. And then once you get out of that, it actually gets the ceiling gets a little bit lower. I think it goes down to like two feet by two feet. And that's called uh, the aorta pass. All right. So we got a, We'll have a map pulled up for the A word to pass um, when you, uh, if you're watching on the YouTube. So once you go through the A word to pass, no big deal. It's it's long and straight. Uh, so you can see all the way kind of towards the end of it if you got your headlamp on. But the hardest part is going through the twists and the turves, turns of the birth canal for 25 feet because you can't really see what's on the other side of the, tur the, the turns. You also have to like angle your body and distort your body and all of these weird ways uh, to get through it. 
Um, and consequently, lots of people do, in fact, get stuck in the birth canal. So in, let's see here, in July of 99, a couple of kids, uh, Chris Hall and it was two Chris, Chris Hale and Chris Morrow. They're 17 years old. Uh, they enter the Nutty Putty Cave uh, and uh, at about nine in the morning, about 90 minutes later, they get stuck. Um, There's a couple of friends that they were with. Their friends come out. They call 911. The rescuers show up. And it takes them until 10.30 p.m. to rescue the first little boy, which was Chris, uh, was Chris Morrow, I believe. And the lieutenant here, the guy in charge was Lieutenant Fernstead. So that's going to be important later on down the road in the story. But anyway, uh, Chris Morrow, Chris Hale, they both get stuck in the birth canal. They can't get out. So their friends go and get help. They come down and uh, they actually come in and they just literally pull the boys out backwards. Takes them about 10 hours. I think they use a little bit of grease in there to try to get them out. Um, but they get them out. And uh, other than having like severe PTSD, a lot of terrible anxiety, uh, they're pretty much unscathed. Uh, the next rescue that takes place is in, in 2001. So two years later, three years later, two 13 year old boy scouts uh, go in to the birth canal again, right? Same place. And they also get stuck as well. Um, problem with this one is, uh, nope, that's the same one. Those are the same two boy scouts. Sorry about that. Uh, the next one, nope, no, I was wrong. So two guys get, they get stuck. They actually pull those guys out by their feet. Same thing as, as before. No big deal. 2004, a 16 year old kid goes into the cave and he gets stuck. It doesn't say that he's in the birth canal. It says he's in another tight spot of the cave, um, which there's lots of tight spaces inside of this cave. But this guy gets stuck. And the reason why he gets stuck is because his leg gets crooked. So he gets stuck in this cave head first. He's got one leg in front of the other. The leg gets pinned down so he can't come back out. They can't actually pull him out backwards because of the way his leg is stuck. So what they do is they rig a pulley system up. They tie it around this kid's ankles. Uh, big, long effort. As a matter of fact, he was, uh, it was like a 400 feet. So he had like 400 feet to go. They just had to drag this kid out. Uh, ends up, the kid gets out. He goes to the hospital. Extremely shooken up. Uh, he was cold. Kind of was going like a little bit hypothermic there, but uh, had really bad leg problems. Leg had fallen asleep for a very long period of time. And so they had to really work like therapy therapy, and all these other things to get his leg working right. Uh, so anyway, this cave is extremely, extremely tight spaces. And uh, I don't know, I, it's, it's too much for me. I wouldn't want to be in there for any amount of time, but whatever. So now let's fast forward to... Uh, to current times here. Let me catch up on my notes. I did take a lot of notes. Again, we, we're just kind of throwing this out there, right? Spur of the moment, trying to entertain you and your cop cars tonight. Cause we don't want to leave you, uh, leave you with nothing. Cause that's how much we, Mike and I care about you. Um, all right. So John, Josh, his brother, John, Josh family, they go splunking in this cave that we're talking about. Everybody goes in and main part of the group, about nine people, they all go to the big slide and they go and hang out and they play around in the big slide. Cause it's not really all that dangerous, right? Some little holes to poke your head through, look at some big giant wide open rooms, some rock formations, all the things that I would probably be interested in. And it would be enough thrills for me, but for Josh and John, it's not enough. So these two dudes, their brothers, they decide they want to go find the birth canal. So they make their way up the big slide. You can put the map up there, Jimmy. They go up this big slide. When they get down the big slide, they it almost drops into like a wishbone like path, right? So if you look, if you can imagine a wishbone, you've got the top bone and you get the little U and you pull on the little U shaped part of the bone, and it breaks off and you make a wish and all the, the things. So the way the wishbone is, is that U shapes off and one goes, one side goes, um, uh, I think it's called uh, Bob's push. Yep, it goes down to Bob's push, which leads to the birth canal. The other part of the U drops down into Ed's push, which is a dead end. Now, the birth the, the birth canal, remember we talked about being like super tight, three feet by two feet, and then it goes even smaller into a two foot by three foot ceiling. So a two foot ceiling by three foot walls. 
So you're sitting in your cop car right now. You're thinking about it. Come on. You know, you know what you can use. That's three feet by 12 feet. You probably got a, a ruler in there somewhere. All those things that you use for uh, crash sites and all those things. Just, just think about it. Three feet tall, two feet tall by three feet wide. That's super small. It's like crawling under the seat of your patrol car for 25 feet. Ridiculous. So John goes first. He ends up, they ends up, they're actually going down Ed's push and not Bob's push. They're going down Ed's push and it's tight just as expected because they think they're in the birth canal, but they've been down there for a lot longer and um, they've been down there longer than they, they should. So they're like, well, maybe we're not, maybe we're not in the right spot. Maybe, maybe we took a wrong turn. So John, he he finds what's a fissure off to his left. And if you don't know what a fissure is, a fissure is like a crack uh, that leads to a very large crack. So he's already inside of a very narrow, probably two feet by two feet uh, hole in the ground. And he sees another hole that is even lower than, than two feet. And it's going to open into this massive room. All right. So the problem with this is, is that he thinks that that room is large enough because of its width that he can kind of go in there, turn around, then his brother Josh can crawl into the same little fissure, turn around, and they can both head back out the same way they came head first. All he has to do is get through the small crack that opens up into the larger room. Now, the, the, here's where it gets really tricky. So this small crack, it's an optical illusion because the wall is actually smaller inside of the hole. So he's trying to get into a hole, which is, which is smaller than two feet. Actually the exact height of the hole that he crawled into is about eight inches, <laughs> eight inches. So he gets this hole and he tries to poke his head into an eight inch hole, which dude, I don't even like my head's probably like Jimmy's head's probably eight inches alone. So he glues his head to the ground. He slides his head down into this crack. He can't even look for it because his head is sideways. He gets into this eight inch crack thinking that he's going into a larger room that he can turn around in and wedge his body. Now look, the ceiling is like right at your face level. So he's literally just going to slide his ass and legs around in a circle to get his head going back out the same way. Um, also not helping with the optical illusion is that this thing is at like a 70 degree angle down going down further deeper into the cave. So this whole thing is just, he thinks he's going to go down into an open room. He's not. It's actually going to even get smaller inside of this eight inch hole. So he sucks in, he gets up to his chest. He, he gets his chest through. Now he's up to his rib cage. He can't get his ribs up into there. So he takes a deep breath, right? He goes, <gasps> sucks in that diaphragm and inches his way in. When he exhales, the diaphragm catches onto the rock. And now he's stuck and he can't exhale all the way, but he also can't inhale any further. So he's just fucking stuck. So he calls out for Josh. Josh is like, yo, I'm right behind you. I'm coming. Josh makes his way. He sees the little eight inch hole. And this is where Josh says that he kind of starts to panic because he's like, oh shit. Uh, he's way down in there. And so Josh, he musters up some intestinal fortitude. He works his way up into that fissure. Not all the way, not as far in as John does, but he gets up enough to where he can grab John's ankle and pull. And remember his face, these guys' faces, they're glued. They're glued to the floor. They're glued that you can't pick your head up or down. Well, we're talking 10, 11 inches where, where Josh is at. So he grabs an ankle and he tries to pull. There's nothing. He can't, he can't get him out. Um, he can't yell either uh, because... He's in a very tight cave. Yelling is just going to bounce off where he's at and stay between him and John. So he's like, John, look, dude, I can't get you. I've got to crawl my ass back out backwards. It's going to take forever, but I got to go get you help, homie. So being religious like they were, being good human beings, um, John and Josh pray. I say a quick prayer. John agrees. Yo, yep, you. Uh, I'll be fine. I'm not going anywhere, obviously. And uh, you go back and get some help. So, uh, Josh heads back out of the cave and he calls the authorities. He lets everybody in the group know, Hey, <laughs> Josh is stuck. Makes a few jokes. Josh is fat, got stuck down in the cave. Fucker. 
we'll get them out and we're gonna have lots of jokes to tell lots of jokes uh so a bunch of people show up um rescue team starts to show up and uh one of the people that what you know because of the notes um a trauma physician doug murdoch is like ah, he's upside down i should probably tag along uh because being stuck upside down for too long creates also another set of issues not just while you're upside down but even after you're not upside down anymore you can have like blood clots in the brain um turns out your lungs evolved to sit on top of all the other organs not the other way around it's crazy how god created us uh perfectly i guess um but your delicate organs they're just not if you're upside down and you reverse where your lungs are supposed to be rather than sitting on top of your organs and your organs sitting on top of them, your lungs become squished. Also, another problem that you have when you're head down is your heart slows down. Um, more blood is getting into your heart than it can push. So your blood pressure goes up. Look, I'm not a doctor. I just read all this stuff on the interwebs, the effects of being stuck upside down for so long. Um, but yeah, you have a hard time maintaining your blood pressure. Eventually, you use the ability to move enough uh, blood around in your body your body starts to develop some toxins as well. So being upside down, again, creates its own problems. So this trauma physician, he shows up on scene. Um, this other first responder, she's a cave rescuer. She's got a little experience under her belt. Her name is Susie. It's always good to have a girl cadaver on your team because obviously girls are a little bit more limber than guys, generally speaking. Also a little bit tinier, a little bit skinnier. So uh, Susie works her way down into the cave. Uh, she comes down with a rope. And uh, she ties it around his ankles thinking, yeah, we've done this before, right? Remember the other kids that got stuck up on the, uh, back in the 90s, tied them around. They were just able to pull them out, pull the, pull the two kids out. So like probably going to be able to do the same thing with John. She gets down there, she ties rope around the ankles. She runs it all the way back out of the cave, which at this point, I'm going to say they were probably a good 70 feet into this thing. 70 or 80 feet. So, you know, it's, it's quite a bit of rope to run. They start to pull on the rope too much friction uh, with all the twisties and the turvies, the curves in the, in the cave. Uh, they, the rope is essentially doing nothing. They're not moving John at all. Um, so meanwhile, there's a lot of logistics going on up top. She's obviously, she has a radio. It's really hard to get to them. The, the, Rescuers are going through the same issues that Josh was having, right? So they're having to glue their face down. They're having to go in one way, come out uh, without, you know, head first. So they have to go in head first and then they have to go out uh, feet first. And I would also like to mention that probably the anxiety for a first responder in this scenario is probably going to be a little bit more than normal because they already know that one dude's been stuck. And just the thought, of somebody being stuck probably makes you think like, oh shit, what if I get stuck? Plus these first responders, they're having to carry some gear. They've got extra safety precautions that they've got to deal with. A lot of logistics here. All this time, John is in this very, very tiny hole all by himself, unable to look anywhere, but basically with your cheek. Like if you were to lay in your blankets, if you're at home right now, put a blanket over, lay, on, lay your head down on the bed, put a blanket over your head and then like, use your middle finger to prop the blanket up. That's about how much room this dude's got. So, um, but John was, you know, talking to Susie. She was like, you know, she could tell that he was starting to get a little bit panicky. His voice was starting to wheeze a little bit. And she's like, you know what? I'm not good with this. Like this isn't sitting well with me. I'm also out of options. I don't know what else to do above my pay grade. I'm starting to get a little bit panicky myself. I'm gonna go ahead and back my ass out of this cave. So, she works her way back out of the cave. She gets up to the top. They talk to the team. Again, all this time, just going by, going by. Well, remember we talked about the other kid that got stuck with his leg all jacked up and they put down a pulley system. So they were like, let's do the pulley thing. We'll hook up a pulley system and uh, we'll get him down there. Now, a pulley system is basically what it is, is that you're driving. If anybody's a rock climber, I am not. So if you guys are experts in the uh, comment section enlighten us but uh you gotta be able to have some room to bolt these things into the wall and when you're working with a three foot by two foot space you don't really have a lot of room to move your arms to be drilling or hammering something into a thick cave rock wall so this takes a lot of time and a lot of pulleys so but they have to get it right because again 
we're up to like eight hours now. And the physician says that 10 hours is when it's getting critical to be upside down. So they're working as hard and as fast as they can getting these pulleys into place, but they're also having to test the strength of each pulley. So they test the pressure of the pulley to determine where the next pulley is going to go because of the twists and the turves through the cave, twists and turns. So they get all of these things bolted, these cams bolted into place. Um, they test all the friction. They think they got everything good. Uh, there's been a lot of time and a lot of, of preparation. Again, we're talking hours here. Um, and so now they're like, all right, we're going to do, uh, we're going to hook this thing up to him and we're going to get him out of here. Now this is a uh, Lieutenant Hodgson was a guy in command uh, up top. And, uh, he was there when Br Brock Clark, I got and stuck the kid with the leg. Um, but Brock Clark was five, seven, 140 pounds. So the kid with the, the jacked up leg, five, seven, 140 pounds. John is my size, six foot, 200 pounds. Right. And um, a lot further, a lot further into the hole than, uh, I think they said that like Clark, uh, Clark was like 40 feet in the hole. Um, and I think, uh, John, I think I somewhere read, we talked about it a couple hundred feet maybe. Um, but John's considerably further in this hole than, uh, than Brock Clark was and a little bit heavier. So it's a little bit trickier. Um, also, and here's another problem. They only had six inches of John's leg showing. I think we have a picture on YouTube of the legs poking out of the hole, but there's only six inches of the, of, of John's leg. So if you look down at your feet and estimate six inches, we're talking from your toes to maybe, maybe midway up your ankle, six inches. I, I don't, I don't know. Maybe, maybe the calf, maybe below your calf, but that's all that's showing, uh, on John. So they hook the ropes around John's ankles and they've got this pulley system. And they're able to pull John up about 10 inches. But here's the catch. Because he was down and the hole that he was going in was also into a room that was only a couple of inches taller. His legs were hitting the roof. And they determined very quickly that in order to get him through the hole, they'd have to break his legs or cut his legs off at the ankles. They did some quick math while being down there. They realized that even if they were to cut his legs off, there still wouldn't be enough room to bend because your shins, your, your bones, they don't bend that way to come up and over out of this cave. So now they're like, okay, shit. <laughs> Dude, he's not coming out that way. The only way that they can do it is if they literally get him horizontal and have him come out of the crack horizontally from the crack because he can't come out vertically because there's just no room to do it. So the next thing is like, let's reroute the pulleys so that it yanks his legs and spins him sideways. And then they can pr pull him out horizontally out of this crack. And then he'll actually be facing in the right direction. They can get him out. But again, took him eight hours to get this far. And now we're talking about redoing all the pulleys. Um, so, they, they start off with this plan of rerouting uh, the pulleys. Uh, at this point, John, his legs are hurting really bad. Um, there's a lot of immense pressure going on right now with his lungs. When we're talking eight hours of being upside down. So a rescuer named Ryan, he heads down. It's his turn to go down in there because, <clears throat> you know, these, you know, everybody gets tired, right? Everybody's down there. Everybody's working. And again, that's 60 degree humid, stagnant air. It's tough. So Ryan heads down into the hole. Um, they had gotten him out about 10 inches. And so he gets down there and he's like, yo, John, how are you doing? And, uh, John says, uh, I'm good. Um, but man, I cannot believe I'm upside down. Why did the rescuers put me in this position? So Ryan's like, hang on, that doesn't make sense. Cause he's been in that position for like eight hours. Obviously John starting to succumb to the pressure, starting to fade out, starting to lose it. So Ryan, uh, starts to do what any good first responder would do. Starts to try to take his mind off of the situation. They start talking about religion, start talking about faith. Ryan notices that when they start to talk about the wife and the daughter, his wife and daughter, that he's actually becoming really good. His breathing starts to get a little bit better. 
His optimism starts to pick up a little bit. So he thinks, hey, you know what? Let's get Emily on scene and let's get them the two of them talking so that we can keep keep him in good spirits and we can still keep working on this plan. So Emily and Elizabeth, they show up on scene. They talk to Lieutenant Hodgson and Hodgson comes over and says, hey, uh, we're working hard. We should be able to get him out of here in no time. Um, but if you want to talk to him, you know, it, it would be great if you talk to him. Now, Emily will later recount that she says she knew something wasn't right because Hodgson had immense tears in his eyes and he could barely say the words, we're going to get him out. So she already knew looking at Hodgson that something was fucked up. I mean, she knew it was fucked up, but now she's guessing that it's really fucked up. So they send the radio, they, they put her over the radio. Ryan turns the volume up. She and John, they start to talk. John's uh, spirits are lifted. He talks about, honey, I can't wait to get out of here. First thing I'm going to do is hug you and Emily. Can't wait to see you guys. They start to pray. They sing some of their favorite hymnals together. Little baby Emily uh, standing right there. He, he can kind of hear uh, baby Emily kind of talking in the background, jabbering. And so uh, at this point, we are talking... Uh, we're co we're coming up on uh, you know 12, 13 hours uh, at the point where they get the pulley ready to go. John's having a real hard time. So Ryan uh, he he tells um, he tells John John look let's go ahead and save a little bit of energy. We're about to begin the pulling process. This is probably going to hurt you a lot, right? They're going to really be twerking on you. I mean, dude, his hip might be popping out of place at this point. Could be chaos. It's not going to be good. So he orders John to, to rest for a few minutes. And he, and he knows that Ryan or John has kind of a second wind after talking to, talking to his wife and daughter. And after a few minutes, uh, everybody's in place. Things are ready to go. Ryan gives a signal and they begin pulling and they pull and they pull and they pull. Um, as they're pulling a loud boom happens. Um, no, I'm sorry. They pull him before this boom happens. They pull him up and they're able to move him another solid 10 inches. And so he holds there, they hold there and Ryan's able to actually wedge himself down into this hole and wrap a rope around John's waist. So he gets down in there. Um, and, and he, and he's like, Hey John, how are you doing? This is the first time now that John has been able to see somebody's face in about 15 or 16 hours. So John gets in there, uh, tells John, hey, look, we're good. Bub. We're going to pull you out from here. I just need you to stay with me, stay calm. Uh, everything's going to be great. We, we, we're making good headway. Ryan backs himself out, gives the go-ahead for them to yank again. They yank again. John starts to scream and yell. Ah, and all of a sudden, a loud bang happens a big explosion ryan blacks out it's unknown it's it's, it's kind of questionable about how long he was out a couple seconds maybe a minute or two but ryan comes back to and he's covered in blood one of the carabiners had broke free of the wall not to any fault of the equipment the wall itself that nutty putty that that clay came loose the bolt launches from the ceiling smacks ryan in the jaw severing his tongue nearly in half and almost breaking his jaw. So Ryan can't speak. Remember, there's no room to work down there. So you can't even like grab your face and be like, Ooh, all he knows is he's basically choking on his tongue at this point. He can't really say anything. There's a lot of swelling going on. There's no room for swelling down there. So Ryan hastily makes his way uh, out of the cave and back up to the top. So he gets to the top. Um, Ryan's like, man, I, I'm fucked up. Give me an ambulance. Ryan's dad, who's also a cave rescue, uh, search and rescue guy, Dave, that's Ryan's dad's name is Dave. Dave says like, all right, I'm going in, I'm, I'm going in. So he gets down there, um, and notices that, uh, worst case scenario, John has slipped actually further back into the hole when the carabiner broke the force of the explosion and the weight and the pressure that was pulling on John gave way. It caused John to slide with momentum on the clay. And now his legs, his feet were like virtually 
not even visible from how far he slid in. So Dave gets down there. He tries to talk with John. John can't. John's talking very shallow, very wheezy. Dave starts to kind of panic. He knows that there is no time. There's no time. So Dave sucks in his own chest, wedges his own self. He's a little bit smaller than John. He wedges himself into the crack, into the fissure. He wedges a rope slowly and methodically through Ryan's torso. He's uh, trying to inch his fingers up underneath the belly of Ryan. He's able to somehow magically get the rope around John's waist and he's able to tie a knot. I mean, you know, such a tribute, right? Like to first responders, like this is a dude <laughs> that's literally putting his life in the worst position to save another dude's life. He gets it. He tied off. He's a little bit excited. Then he finds out he himself is stuck right next to John. <sighs> At this point, we've been in this cave for 19 hours. Both of these guys are stuck. So Dave slowly, methodically works his way back out, takes him, I think it says maybe like an hour to get himself unstuck. Uh, at this time, he realizes there's no pulse on, on John's feet um, or on his leg. He knows it's been too long. He can't leave the cave. Uh, there's just no time. So there's a little tiny hand drill down there. He's able to make his way. He's, about, he's able to chip off about six inches, which does absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. Um, and at 11.56 p.m., John is pronounced dead after a 28-hour battle. Stuck. Upside down. Inside of a cave. Uh, it's late at night. Emily doesn't believe. Uh, that he's dead, doesn't want the first responders to leave, doesn't want anybody to leave John's side because what if John wakes up and he's all alone? They say she he doesn't have a pulse and she responds with, well, maybe he just lost so much blood in his legs that there's no pulse in his legs, but there's no way to know that he doesn't have a pulse in his neck. So they agree to stay overnight um, to no avail. They get up in the morning they get back down into the cave. He is unresponsive. At this point, he'd been unresponsive um, for about 12 hours. They call the efforts. They don't want to endanger any more rescuers while they're down there. Uh, at this point, it is futile because with John dead, they can't eat with him alive. It was a small chance of getting him out of that hole, but they would have needed him to wiggle his head. They would have needed to wiggle his shoulders in certain ways. Um, so to get a lifeless body out of there, they deemed was impossible and the uh, lieutenant had to uh to go over to emily and break his promise and say i, I know i promised you that we were going to get john out but there's no way that we can get john out of this cave um couple of, i guess a couple of days later maybe a week later they actually uh cement john into his resting place permanently there's no way to get john out uh so very tragic. Um, he leaves behind uh, a pregnant wife who has a daughter, uh, a daughter, Emily. Um, but story gets a little bit lighter. Um, Emily has the baby that she was pregnant with. What do you think she names the baby? It's a baby boy, by the way. Yeah, that's right. Names the baby John. Mm, tugs on the heartstrings. Uh, after a few years, she decides to uh, start dating again. She later goes on to get remarried. Uh, her father is the uh, is the head of ceremony. I don't know what you call that in the Muslim religion, but uh, I guess maybe the preacher, the pastor, the officiant. Uh, so he officiates the wedding. And John's dad walks her down the aisle. That's where I about lost it. Um, and so, yeah, there is the story of the nutty putty cave death. I hope that I have aroused your anxieties tonight. Uh, if anybody has any stories that are like this or want to call in, Jimmy can put the, uh, Jimmy can put the phone number up on the screen. If you just want to tell me how terrible this show is without Mike, I'm fine with that too. Look, I get it. Nobody, nobody wants to go to church when the assistant pastor is preaching. And I think that is why they don't tell you 
that he's preaching until you get there. Cause they know, <laughs> and the number is not one 900 transit. You son of a bitch, Jimmy, you son of a bitch. God, have you no decency? Have you no sanctuary? Tell this whole fucking story. So yeah, call now 984 810-8908. Uh, <laughs> yeah, do not call 1-800-TRANS-TRANSY. Uh, I promise you that that is... Uh, and, and listen, if you're listening to the podcast, don't call that number either. Um, because you're a day late and a dollar short. The show is live on Tuesday nights at 8 p.m. on the Mike the Cop YouTube channel. If you're listening to it on podcast, show's already over, homie. Show is already over. Um, oh, Dylan, this didn't get your anxiety? Damn, you, you're a bigger man than I am. You're a bigger... Man, than I am. Hey, look, if you got something crazy, look, if you're sitting in your cop car, if you guys ever uh, Googled Lion Eats Man, there's a hundred videos of lions eating human beings on YouTube that also gets my anxiety going. Uh, if you guys have had any great rescues that are similar to this, I know that uh, I serve on a dive rescue team on a voluntary status. I'm basically a glorified cheerleader on that team. But, uh, I know that those guys all have some crazy stories. I was hoping they would call in tonight, but uh, they're all on shift. They're all on shift tonight. Um, but yeah, uh, I think somebody's asking when will uh, Mike be back? Mike will be back Friday. Oh, by the way, today's show brought to you by Mint Mobile. Mint Mobile, they have provided the phone number, the phone line. Um, I like the stories about underwater cave divers. Yes. Not only do they need to navigate the cave, they are on time for air. So I don't know how to say that name. Zafiel? 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 Zaf I don't know, dude. Sorry. Or lady. Uh, I have no idea how to say that name. Yes, there are some really crazy... Uh, so people go into these caves with GoPros on, and then they fucking die with the GoPros on. And so they recover the bodies and the GoPros, and then they put this shit on the interwebs, and you can you can actually watch these people in their last moments. There's one where this guy, he's scuba diving, jumps off of the boats, never scuba dived before. Uh, doesn't let the air into his vest or whatever, the little buoyancy thing, the regulator drops straight to the bottom. <sighs> Boom. I mean, I don't even know. It's like 80 feet or something crazy dies. Look guys, one, eight, one, nine hundred trains. It's not that funny. There's people in the comments for those of you who are listening on podcasts that, um, people are all laughing at the one, nine hundred transy. So it's not all that funny. Uh, man, those rescuers gave. They're all, yeah, Sacred Shaman, I, I think it's I think it's crazy. I, I'm telling you right now, if, if, I'm a, if I'm a first responder, look, call it in, guys. Call it in. Let me know some of the scary situations that you've had to be in or, or you might know people have been in. But I myself, you know, that's one of those things where it's like, hey, Eric, you're the first responder and you, for some odd reason, maybe I'm the skinniest, the most in-shape guy there. And they're like, you've got to go. You've got to go get into this cave. Oh, look, one of the uh, one of the dive team guys is calling, but he's calling the wrong number. Jimmy, could you take care of this? Tell him to call the uh, the correct number. And we'll tell you, this is actually uh, one of the officers on the dive rescue team that I know have some some stories. But yeah, I mean, in the comments or or whatever, what like what's the scenario that you say no to? Like, I'm not doing that. Uh, if they say go in to this tight spot and you got to save this life. I mean, for me, I've, I thought about it a hundred times. What if somebody's trapped on ice in the middle of a pond? I, I'm a Florida boy. I don't do well in the cold and I, I definitely am not going to do well on the ice. Do I go out on the ice or do, do I, uh, or do I stay on the shore? Cause I can't do it. I don't know. Um, are you on uh, rebel? Yeah. Rebel, listen, tonight we're talking, uh, thank you for calling into the Failure to Stop Night Shift. I know this is a surprise to you. We were talking about the Nutty Putty Cave death, uh, just told a horrific story, and I'm uh, glad you called Dan. Wanted to ask you a couple of questions. You got a few minutes? Absolutely. So I know you're on a dive uh, recovery team. You guys call it a recovery team? Well, we call it a dive team. Yeah, it's a dive rescue recovery. We got the no misnomer of rescue just in case there ever happens to be one, but it's mainly recovery. It's mainly recovery. So if you're on scene, most likely they are not. Correct. They have left this world. Um, and I, you know, I, I've worked with you guys again in a very support, a very basic support role. I'm, I'm basically a glorified cheerleader on that squad. I just want to be where I can help, but I've seen you guys go into some really dark, murky, even cold water. We were on a rescue last October about this time. Um, yeah. 
Uh, the Noose River had really overflown. It was very muddy, murky water. It was flowing really fast. My biggest fear where you guys were under the water was that if one of those big logs that was rushing past us, what if one of those hits you guys while you're down there? What are some of the fears that you go through while you're down under the water? Do you think about any of those things? Well, you think about it uh, as part of the, the, the scene size of what can happen and what can go bad and whether you, because we do a risk benefit assessment. Um, we're going to go and we are going to find uh, what we need to find and recover what we can. Uh, but we also look at what, what can hurt us in the process of doing that. And is it worth doing so? Um, so it, it, that particular recall, it was um, logs are coming down. We had some flooding. We, we've had some overflow. We got toxins in the water and, and pollution. So yeah, it goes, goes through your head, but um, we dive fully encapsulated. Um, and uh, uh, that means that we don't actually get wet when we're underwater. Um, so the, 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 uh, substances that could harm us stay on the outside um, and we have somebody that's watching to make sure that uh, a some if something does break loose they can uh, have a tender to, to protect them and we also have a, a safety diver that is there in case anything happens that they can put their mask on and then get in the water so um, in this in this instance and we we're talking about the the, the a cave death here um which was not underwater but um some of the things that I thought about when I was tendering for you guys on that rescue was, yeah, you've got very dark water, very cold water. And I, I know that you're in a dry suit, but you still get extremely cold down there. Um, oh, absolutely. The fear is, is, is what if the car breaks loose? It goes on top of you. Who's there? How much oxygen? How much time do you have? Are these things that go through your head? Or are these things that you mentally have to talk yourself out of while you're down there? Because a lot of times that you guys are down underneath the water, it takes a lot of time. I mean, you guys can be down there for over an hour. Uh, generally, we, we try to keep it to 20 minutes. Uh, it can go longer than that. Uh, but we, we dive in teams and, and try to keep it at 20 minutes. Uh, because of oxygen cons uh, conservation and, and stuff, we can extend that out. And there's other, uh, other ways of uh, supplied air and stuff like that. But um, yeah, those, those go through your mind and you got to be able to put it away. Well, um, I would say that, uh, I man, that must've been the longest 20 minutes of my life on this last one. Cause, uh, I really felt like he was down there for a lot longer. Somebody in the comments says that you only need a dry suit if you're in freezing water. Uh, what are some of the other purposes correct. for a dry suit? Uh, that is not correct. Uh, we, we use a dry suit, um, uh, because it's uh, total body isolation. Uh, we use the dry suit for temperature regulation and we wear thermals underneath it. But a dry suit itself doesn't uh, actually keep you much warmer. It just keeps you drier. Uh, right. You have to have thermals underneath that uh, uh, dry suit to work. So we the dry suit is more for toxins off. Yeah. Dry, dry suit is more to keep the icky stuff. Cause a lot of times you guys are diving for bodies, right? Correct. Correct. And bodies give off all sorts of nasty fluids. Um, have you recovered any bodies? I have. Yeah. Uh, you, is there any, any instances, any particulars you can tell us about that? Uh, they're, they're, you're diving with somebody who's deceased. So right. anything that happens when they decease above water is also going to happen underwater. So there's body bodily fluids that leak and, and, uh, they're in water. So you're, it's everywhere. So every person that you recover, you take apart with you because they're, in the water and i imagine it's got to be you're not di i mean if you're diving here in north carolina it's not like you're diving off a of key west where you can see right so you're probably Correct. i mean is it dark it is dark yeah. um, mo most of the recoveries we've done have either um been in zero or no visibility and so basically at that point you're just putting your hands out there waiting to feel something that feels like a human correct God bless. And listen, I, I mean, that's scary enough for me. I think about these guys in Florida that have to do that when there could be an alligator that they're feeling for, um, or uh, some kind of a ginormous species of fish that we don't even know about. To me, I'd be thinking about the lot of monster. I've trained with you guys. I've gone under the water with you. Uh, so for some basic scuba diving, some basic training with you guys, but the water was clear and I could see what I was doing. Um, you did have me go through some tunnels, but you could see inside the tunnels. You can see on the other side of the tunnel, uh, I cannot imagine doing that in the darkest of areas and trying to find a body. Yeah. Um, a lot of us that have done it have also done the training with the fire department where um, 
you go into a zero visibility with the house. And so it's the same search patterns uh, and the same things, but we don't just dive underwater and then swim around. We, we use uh, oriented man searches and we use uh, line poles and, and communications. So we're actually talking and the, the tender can, uh, we talk back and forth to the tender and, and we can say, hey, you're going the wrong way or uh, guide them and search a, a pattern. Sometimes we use grid pattern searches where we uh, uh, separate the area we're searching into patterns and uh, dive a pattern. Do you ever, uh, do you ever get scared? Do you ever like, does anything ever scare you while you're down there? I've been scared a couple times. Yeah. What Uh, scares you? um, uh, uh, A poor tender one time, uh, things didn't go the way it was supposed to happen. And uh, uh, things got uh, a little, a little hectic and uh, the ropes were, were not helping. They were more of a hindrance and uh, a danger. By the way, a tender is somebody who is going to hold on to the rope that uh, is basically like a lifeline for the diver. It's also a form of communication. A diver can tag on the tug on the ropes to uh, let people know like, Hey, I found something or Hey, I'm fucked. Um, but also if you aren't paying attention as a tender and that rope gets loose when you can't feel the tugs to that rope can catch on all that fucking gear that you got down there. Yep. Um, so, th- th- but you don't, you're, do you ever get scared of like fucking sea monsters or any of that bullshit? Uh, not really. I've dove in some pretty cool places that have some pretty big fish. Uh, um, I dove in the Columbia river, uh, that has sturgeon that get up to nine feet tall and, um, uh, dove with some pretty big catfish and some pretty big turtles that can leave a mark. Um, there are alligators up here in North Carolina, but I've not seen one in any place that I was in other than, you know, fishing. So yeah, I don't care if I've seen it or I didn't see it. Listen, I'm, I'm afraid of lions walking around at night. I know there's no lions in North Carolina, still fucking scared of them. They don't call it the North Carolina Panthers football team for nothing. Somebody saw a fucking exactly. Panther somewhere at some time and named a fucking yeah. football team after it. Yeah. You don't know if there's a gator in that thing. It could be uh, the Loch Ness Monster. Uh, Rebel, also, man, I, I really appreciate your call tonight. Um, yeah, if you get a chance, go back and listen to this episode. It was a doozy. But we appreciate all you first responders that are going out there and doing these things. Um, I know there's one girl on the team, uh, and I forgot her name, but she she's a cave diver, correct? Yes. And, uh, man, I, I don't know. That, that just seems like uh, she definitely has bigger balls than I do. I'm not one. I don't know that I'm diving in there with you guys to find a body. I know that we practice and we train together. I think I'm good on top of the water. Um, I like to know what goes on under the water so that I'm better prepared on top of the water, but I have no desire to get under there in the dark and do the shit that you guys do. You guys are way braver, way bigger men than I'll ever be. And I use that in the most sincere way. Uh, We're all part of the team, man. <laughs> uh and um uh, rebel um I, are we allowed to say what your rank is on that team i, I don't think it really matters i don't know uh, which, lieutenant you're a lieutenant on the team so how long have you been on that team uh six or seven years oh wow yeah six and i was on a, a team in ohio for several years so you got a lot of uh, a lot of time under your belt well oh, hey, listen bit. thank you for all that you do i hope that you're staying safe out there and uh appreciate you calling in tonight Absolutely. Take care, brother. All right. We got another caller. What do we got? Oh, got to call him back. But hold on to what you got. We got us another caller. What could it be? Oh, here we go. Your name Patrick. Hey. Th- hey. Uh, <laughs> who is this? This is Patrick. Hey, Patrick. Thank you for calling 1 900 Trans Transit. No, I'm just kidding. Thanks for calling in. Failure stop tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, listen. Yeah, sorry it uh, took me a minute to get there. I was out doing some other things, <laughs> out to uh, giving COVID shots to children. <laughs> oh, sounds good, Patrick. Um, we've been talking about the uh, Nutty Putty Cave death tonight. Uh, lots going on with that. It was a tragic story. I don't know if you heard the whole show or not, um, but we wanted to get your take on that. Uh, kind of what you, I know you work in this field. I, I believe you you also work on a dive recovery team. I do. Uh, actually, I'm the captain of that and the uh, uh, chief medical officer. 
Oh, I'm so glad you you called in. I've I've gotten to work with you on a couple of calls, a, a more of a uh, cheerleader role. Again, um, uh, we just spoke with Rebel, so it's kind of interesting, kind of fun to watch you guys work. But we were talking about this this tragic cave death and this this covenant. And this is a call in show, so it's a lot of fun. But you know, we're going to get your take on on kind of like what you what kind of why do you get into something like that, and and is it as scary as it as it looks? Well, oh yeah. And, uh, and, and what people do, um, you know, on this case, as well as the case that brought everything up to light on a public safety diver was the 2018, uh, Thailand incident with the soccer players. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. And, uh, and, and what it did is it, it actually brought a lot to light about, wait a minute, you know, is this just a diver type or is this somebody that can go in and do these things? And we found out absolutely not, uh, that this is an extremely technical uh, process because most people, oh, I see a cave, I'm going to descend in it, uh, and I'm going to be an explorer, and they have all this romanticism, and you know, Jacques Cousteau probably would have loved what I've done, and they get in, and, and there's so many conditions that they have to worry about. But the big thing we saw, and the biggest lesson we saw from uh, the public safety divers from the Thailand incident, that was extremely successful. Uh, however, we did uh, we did have a few losses. Most of them were, uh, you know, uh, some some pretty good divers. There was one that was a Thailand Navy SEAL. And what they didn't take into account is when they descend and go into these caves to facilitate rescue is the atmospheric pressure as they descend. And we found that out because, you know, the, the pressure increased as they, they kept descending. They thought they were in 10 feet of water where the, the flow was of the water and trying to get in and, uh, and mitigate the situation. But they found out that they were basically down about 110 feet, even though only 10 feet of that was water and their gas and air consumptions went through the roof and they didn't plan for that. And the deaths of the Navy SEAL, the Thailand Navy SEAL and the other diver was completely um, air exhaustion. They completely burned it out. I thought that was the most fascinating thing about this case because, you know, 150 feet, 1500 even 1500 feet that's like a half a kilometer that doesn't seem oh. that far but then when you watch the videos of people going through these die what these these caves that's a very long way oh it's an extremely long way and we have some excellent people i mean you know uh, we have one of the world's leading uh cave explorers uh based out of florida it's associated with a, a group that you're familiar with it's air hogs and her name is Jill Henneth, and she has a wonderful book about exploring caves and everything. And she is one of the foremost technical divers uh, for cave and facilitates and teaches a great class. Now, me, I have not taken a class. I've been through the caves. I've done some cave rescue. Uh, I have not been through a class, and it is so technical um, because you have to stage air. You have to plan for your dive, dive your plan. And basically, if you're coming through with these tight squeezes, these uh, little, uh, you know, crevices and everything to continue on your mission, um, is that, you know, you may have to completely, um, doff all your gear and then pass it through, then swim through after your gear and stage further gas bottles. And the further deeper you go atmospherically, not just depth of water is you have to plan for that gas consumption. And that's where everybody seems to be pulling out. Now, the role of these uh, cavers that do it for uh, technical diving, and it's a fabulous sport and wonderful experience, uh, these people spend so much time planning their dives. There's a famous one that I don't know if you've even broached yet, is uh, because I was, uh, you know, I apologize, I was over in uh, uh, Orange County uh, inoculating children, but it's, um, uh, <laughs> there's a famous one in Brazil. Uh, of a uh, a diver that was caving and just beyond his experience, and uh, he didn't plan, and of course he met his demise. And the family was a wealthy family that hired a very technical diver. He was an airline pilot for the Brazilian Airlines, and it, he planned it for over eight months to go down and retrieve this victim. And he actually filmed his own death. That was was uh, that, was that in the nineties? Yeah, it was in the late. 90s. That was actually the first. The, the cool thing about that case is that was the first GoPro. So they had actually like invented a GoPro for that rescue. So he it had sure the whole was. thing on video. Yeah, and he used and some of his illumination that he used was aircraft landing lights. And I mean, he planned it. It was expert. He had a great team. But at the very end of it, and uh, when I see you privately, I'll show you that. Uh, but he actually gets his arm trapped because of he was reclamating and trying to recover the body so the family can intern them and do their closure. 
but the body had deteriorated that it did separate. And he reached in too far and he got caught and you can hear him. And then you, you slowly see him running out. And yeah, but he, he worked, he worked the entire time. I've, I've watched that video several times. Um, mm -hmm. So when he cuts the, the body free, what he didn't think about was the body for whatever reason, just started spinning like an alligator. Yes. And, and, and that and he tangled him all up that and he lost a particular piece of the body that needed to be uh, recovered mm. and uh you know uh and and then you hear him get stuck yeah and in english you hear him go uh-oh <laughs> and then he's watching his gas consumption yeah. and there wasn't anybody down there and the rule of uh, and the rule of this technical diving is you need to prepare to rescue yourself because nobody else can help you. yeah nobody and, else is coming oh yeah that and even your dive buddy he's going to be on bingo air too and so he's more than likely going to uh, evacuate, but it's uh, yeah, it's in the big and the technical issue is that people just don't plan for uh, some of the depths and and uh, and planning for, you know, those thirds that they teach, you know, a third down, a third back, a third reserve. And uh, and most of the deaths that we see now are uh, and the troubles are of complete, you know, gas uh, you know, uh, they just empty their tanks and just didn't plan for enough. Or they get in without the technical expertise, move too much, and they silt up the area, and they get virtually cave vertigo. Right, and that's where they, you, is they, cave vertigo, is that just like where you don't know if you're up or down? or Exactly. Oh, and uh, they get completely disoriented. Uh, but it's funny that you would know. Matter of fact, you're one of the first people that, uh, that I've talked to of recent that would know that this was one of the first versions of the GoPro that actually filmed this guy. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I talked about at the beginning of the show today is that, uh, when, when I was bored and, and this is a different show than normally my, my co-host, Mike, the cop, famous Mike, the cop, uh, I'm like the assistant pastor, Mike, the cop is sick. He's got the, the, the Rona. So he's, he's doing the right thing. He's staying out of the studio, <clears throat> quarantining himself. So left me to be assistant pastor tonight. And so I just did the, the case, of the nutty putty cave death because what I used to do in my cop car when it rained or it snowed and I didn't have anything to do is I would work my own anxiety up for whatever reason because I'm a sick fuck. I don't know. But I would watch these <laughs> videos of these people dying, parachute accidents, all these things oh. that I guess maybe it keeps me from doing something so stupid. But I, I remember watching that film um, intently. Also, the, the Taiwan rescue, I, I've watched about every every part of that. Um, but, you know, in, in the case of this one, um, with the nutty putty cave, you know, I thought it was, uh, you know, they, they weren't in water. So there was a lot of time. And, and I know that the planning doesn't change, you know, piss poor planning, whatever, uh, preparation, planning, the whole thing. Um, for you as a captain, you're up on the shore. Time is always of the essence. How does that count into, how does that play into your planning? Cause you can't just sit there and fucking plan all day. No, you can't plan it. And uh, that's why local resources are so freaking important to us and anybody that knows the area that we're trying to get into. Uh, like you said, Nutty Buddy was, you know, it was a dry issue uh, where we configure everything for a wet issue. And uh, and having local resources are, are just so important. Then having some type of topography and having an expert, whether it's, uh, you know, the emergency management, it could be uh, geo uh, specialists. That say, hey, wait a minute, that 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 cavern down there doesn't have a, a ventilation outlet, or it is of some material that could be caustic to the human lungs, um, and uh, and so you, we have to watch that. Then, you know, believe it or not, even down there, there's uh, there's explosion issues from dust particles, and you know, and people survive and they go to light fires, and next thing you know is they're burning all the oxygen in a confined space, and uh, and unfortunately, what that is. Once we do that, they just get lethargic. They start slowing down, and then poof, uh, they're gone, and it's now it's it's a body recovery. Uh, but you know, one thing one thing that I recall about the, uh, the the Taiwan incident is, you know, the divers that that completed that mission were from uh, Britain, very technical, very specialized guys. But there were over ten thousand people on that scene. Yeah, because they were pumping scene. water. They had to pump water. It was oh. probably one of the biggest rescue efforts that's ever taken place yeah and uh it got and, so big that they had a hard time feeding and housing everybody yeah they brought in the u.s navy 
yeah. <laughs> you know, so it's, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's absolutely amazing. And on the medical side, when we look about it is we, we try to configure, um, what is life sustaining? I mean, how long do we have to facilitate a, a human rescue, a live rescue? And we do that. And there's always that second guesswork about, well, okay, what else, what condition are they in? Are they injured? Um, is the, uh, materials of where they're uh, housed, is it supportive of life? Um, and we're always guessing when we do that. And so the local resources and just like, you know, picking up the cop that said, Hey, wait a minute, hold on. You know, I used to hunt or you know, fish back here and they would know certain areas and say, you know, there is a hole back here. That may be the one that, Hey, there's an alternate rescue site. So yeah. local people, everybody across the street, you know, we'll, we'll take in any advice anybody can give us. And especially if it's, uh, from the locals and, uh, well, Patrick, I appreciate you calling in tonight, man. Uh, it means a lot. I'm going to go ahead and wrap up tonight's show. It's been a, it's been a real hoot. It's been a real whirlwind of a show. My anxiety is pumping right now. That's it. I gave wow. myself, I gave myself an anxiety attack tonight writing the script for this entire show. Hey, hey, but you know, you have such a great program, and uh, and you know, it's <laughs> it, it's funny, and you keep it live. And man, I'm just a, you know, I've become a big fan. Oh, I appreciate it, sir. And I, I can't wait to see you at the next training event. Oh, you'll see me there. And again, thanks so much. And any other feedback or questions, just give me a shout. All right, Captain. Have a good night. See you later. Well, guys, listen, there's 171 of you still left watching. Only 150 have hammered that like button on YouTube. Make sure you hit it on on uh, on the YouTube. And then also, it uh, really helps Mike and I out when you head over to iTunes. iTunes is like the fucking leader of the fucking charts and the boards and all that shit, uh, which is what gets us paid. If you go over there and you leave a quick review, quick, a little five star, write a comment. Um, look, enough of you guys have made fun of me being a transy, uh, but we are, you know, we're over a thousand, 1100 reviews on iTunes. Um, we've moved up significantly on the charts and that's, that's all cause you, man, we, we freaking love you guys. The Wolfpack, your shirts are all out on the way. We had just a huge run on shirts last month. Um, as you know, the supply chains is hard, but believe it or not, the hardest thing right now is we're working with uh, postal services. Everybody's kind of backed up in certain ways. People are having a hard time hiring folks, whatever. There's a million excuses. None of them are coming from us. Shirts are done. They're on the way. Um, just be patient with us. If you want one of these shirts, use that promo code Google. Guns up, giddy up, and get you that 15% off. Uh, but hey, listen, fun show. Everybody say a prayer for Mike. Hopefully he'll be back here on Friday. And uh, we'll be rocking and rolling as always. Until next time, Wolfpack. Oh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I did that just to piss Mike off. Uh, until next time, guys. Cheers.